So uh, as I was preparing uh, for my talk on Sunday, um, it suddenly struck me uh, the huge timeliness of what we were looking at. Uh, and so I just wanted to share a bit about uh, and uh, uh, an extract of what uh, I said on Sunday. Um, our country, it's obvious, isn't it? Our world, in fact, is, is seemingly gripped by fear at the moment. Uh, an uncontrollable virus that is sweeping across our world. And, uh, I wanted to say a bit about um, fear uh, and, uh, and to offer real hope uh, in the midst of fear. Uh, and that we as, as God's people, uh, as disciples of Jesus, um, that we are the ones who uh, carry the antidote to fear. You see, a misplaced fear um, can very easily become a tyrant in our lives. It can restrict us and leave us feeling debilitated uh, in some or much areas of our lives. And so fear starts to dictate uh, and so often then fear becomes the master of our thoughts and our actions. We become a slave to fear. Uh, and the impact can be huge. It can take a long time to heal uh, from situations or experiences that cause fear in our lives. The fears that we carry often don't have an easy fix. But actually, there is a fix. Do not be afraid. It is one of the most repeated commands in the Bible. Again and again, we hear this command, this plea, spoken to God's people. So why does God say this so often in the Bible? Well, God says it so often is because he recognises that fear can make us less of who he wants us to be, of who he created us to be. When fear dictates our lives, when it starts to rule over our thoughts and our actions, we stop living our lives according to God's ideals and his intentions. You see, we read in the Bible that fear is the opposite of love. John, uh, writing in his first letter, says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because Fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So in those words, we start to see what might be the antidote to fear. So often we think we should be fighting against the particular fear. But actually, I think we need to be fighting for the antidote for fear. We need to fight for love. Perfect love drives out fear. And so if we pursue love, if we pursue a perfect love, love becomes the antidote for fear. I love the story at the end of Mark 4, when the disciples are in the boat with Jesus. Now Jesus is tired. He's been teaching extensively. He's been healing the sick and performing miracles. Crowds of people have been vying for his attention desperate to see him perform a new miracle, for themselves to be healed. And Jesus, in all his humanity, is now pretty tired. So he needs some space, and so he and his disciples, they get in the boat as evening draws in. They try to get some space. But the clamour and noise of the crowd is replaced by the clamour and the noise of the wind and the waves. But Jesus is chill. You know, he's pretty tired, uh, and so he's still sleeping, despite the fact that the boat, the text says, is nearly being swamped. Water coming in, he's loving life, sleeping on his cushions. And the disciples can't believe this. And we read that they say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? I love it. It, it seems such a, a passive, aggressive question. Their real question is probably something like this. What are you doing sleeping? Why the heck aren't you helping us? We're going to die. Why were they so afraid? No doubt they would have responded like this if you'd asked them the question at the time. Well, look around. Isn't it obvious? The disciples had good reason to panic, good earthly reason for the way that they were responding. 
and none of them were experienced boatmen, and they had probably seen what waves like this could do to boats. And so they acted, maybe like all of us would, they panicked. And so they then wake Jesus. And Jesus doesn't answer them immediately. He simply gets up. He rebukes the storm, the wind and the waves, and immediately everything calms down. The disciples must have been uh, completely dumbfounded, mouths dropping to the floor of the boat. And then he turns to his disciples and he says this, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? It feels like a rebuke. And I think it's important to note that when Jesus says this, he's saying this not merely because they fear the storm. Fear of a, a danger stronger than we are is appropriate. It's how we're made. It's part of our DNA. But Jesus rebukes them for fearing the lesser power over the greater power. And Jesus asks the same question for us today in these times that we are in. Why are you so afraid? It's a profound question. Because who or what we believe is most powerful will be the master of our thoughts and actions. For the disciples, fear of the winds and the waves, that they might suddenly be drowned, that fear is replaced by a new fear. But this is a very different type of fear. It says in the text that they were terrified. They were terrified. And they say to one another, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You see, suddenly their fear of the earthly wind, of the waves, of the threat that their boat might sink, actually that is replaced by new fear. But this is an awe, a wonder of this extraordinary person that even the wind and the waves obey him. And because of that, the text said they were terrified. This is a fear that isn't oppressive or dangerous. This is a fear full of awe and wonder. The same man who had compassion and mercy for the sick, who had reached out in love to so many, that same man was more powerful, was powerful beyond all their understanding. You see, the secret to our freedom from enslavement to our irrational and excessive fears is what you might describe as a fear transfer. We need to stop fearing other things more than Jesus. Those other things, whether imagined or real, may be bigger than we are and therefore frightening to us. But Jesus is bigger than all these things. And we know that with Jesus, nothing is impossible. So how do we do this? How do we transform or transfer our fear of the storms of life to Jesus? And even when the storms are still raging, as it might feel like at the moment. The answer, as the disciples found, is to draw closer to Jesus. To draw closer to perfect love. The, the disciples must have felt at that moment, I'm definitely sticking with this guy. He is awesome. Actually, like the disciples, Jesus is in the boat with you. And like the disciples, you can take all your fears to him. But unlike the disciples, don't panic and assume that he doesn't care. He cares far more than you will ever know. And he is in control. He is at work, working even in the midst 
of the storms of life, walking with us through those times. And so on the back of that, there's also a response. As we start to experience, as we start to know this love in our lives, Jesus then calls us to go. To, in a sense, take that antidote of fear into our world. Loved people love Loved people love people. And so when we know that we are loved by a perfect love, we're then enabled to go and love others. And so Jesus calls us to go, to go into a world so full of fear and to speak the peace of Jesus, to help people turn from the focus and fixation on their fears and focus on person of Jesus, to encounter relationship with him. And in light of all that is happening in our world at the moment, people must be and are full of fear. But as Christians, we are called to go into our world and to speak love into those situations. And that would be my encouragement.